All right, here we go. Overdrive off and running. TSN 1050 on the TSN app. Your home smart speaker and up on TSN 4. Look who we have here. Jason Strudwick is back. Struddy, Strutter Dud coming up a little bit later in the hour. A fresh batch of I thought it might have been too early, gentlemen, to do Strud and Dud again, but no way. The people want it, and we're going to bring it to them. I'm having a difficult time seeing you guys, by the way. Because of Doogie's cologne, Hayes, I don't know if you've ever <laughs> caught wind of this action. Mm-hmm. I'll say one thing to you, Doogie. I hope she likes you. Because I walked out in the hallway to put something in the garbage, Hayes, and I'm sure you've experienced this. It was like 40 puffs of Dracar Noir <laughs> right into the air. Yeah. He loves a cologne, man. Doogie's got a scent. He's got a vibe and a scent, and he's Holy. sending it out. And if you don't like it, that's a you problem, not so a what Doogie does he problem. Do? Does he spray it on and walk into it, or is he ad- applied directly? Because I think you got to walk into it. You spray it and walk into it. But what but does Strud, do? The, bu- the, bu- the point of the story is, in radio, we're a bunch of pigs around here, and there's no one to impress. No one comes Fair around point. here. Fair point. And... Why would this guy spray up for the start of the show? <laughs> it was like at 3.45, he said, it's go time, the show's starting, and I got to cologne up. And I think I- he has a pre-show routine, Doogie, and I, I greatly appreciate it because you never know who you're going to meet, who you're going to come across, who's going to turn the corner, sure. right? CEO of the company could walk in, and all of a sudden he goes, man, that smells phenomenal. That smells like success. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that? And that's where Doogie steps in. And then we never see him again because all of a sudden he's like the CFO or something and he's skyrocketing sure. up the chain. Um, he's a man of integrity, Doogie. And <clears throat> I, I know what you mean. He's got the scent. He's got the whole thing going. <laughs> and it is a beautiful vibe. He has a vibe, vibe going. Doogie, do you want to comment on that? Well, why do you cologne up before the show? <laughs> Boys, it doesn't matter where I go. You always have to smell good. I was always taught that. That's great. Oh, That's great because dude, Second, what a line, Struddy. Always have to smell good, That's, Strud. He's got a lot of pleasantries. I'm sure you've heard from Doogie. It's always good morning, good yes. afternoon. How are you? I hope things are well. He is. He's amazing to deal with, Doogie. Sexy voice. So is that? Does he have yeah. a cold or something? Like, or is no, that? Is he's that, got the. Is, he, he's 19 and he's got a raspy voice of a 40 wow. year old. He's dialed yeah, in, he's, man. This guy's a stud. Yeah. Sounds like a jazz singer who you know, smokes two packs a day. That's no. what he sounds like. No smoking. It's just cologne and wow. maybe a jazz flute. I don't know. I don't know what he plays. <laughs> the saxophone. <laughs> Something's going on with Doogie, but he definitely is a musical genius. He <laughs> smells great, and he's on top of things with this show because we got a great one today. Duffy's coming up later in the hour from Augusta National. Tiger spoke today. Everything's coming together for Tiger. Right? Dude, did that not sound like every event, Hayes, for the last two years where he's like, it's Monday, he's got a, or it's Tuesday, he's got, he's got, he's got to win. He's going to win. Yeah. And yeah. then come Friday, it's like, my back is so sore right now. <laughs> well, I can't stand up. I don't want to laugh at that. Uh, we'll play the Tiger here in a second, what he had to say about you know where his game was at. I did find it interesting that he said at Riviera he wasn't ready yet, where I thought he got sick. I thought he was sick, and that's why he. What did I tell play, you? But what did I tell you? He did not. He was not sick. He realized that he was going to shoot eighty four at Genesis, and he said, "I got to get the hell out of here." Yeah. I had an In and Out burger the other day, and it's making me sick, and I got to use that <laughs> as. An ex- yeah, I think you. that Shank his Shank on eighteen on the Thursday at the Genesis, I think, was terrifying for Tiger. But yes. that's a distant memory now. You just want to hear from Tiger what he had to say. And again, you're right. This could have been 2023, 2022, 2021. But here's Tiger on everything coming together at Augusta this week. What do you believe that you can do this week? If everything comes together, I think I can get one more. Jeez. You want me to describe that any more than that? Or we're good. <laughs> All business. Dude, every Tuesday he says the same thing. And if he uh, says to Todd Lewis on Friday when he's missing the cut, my back's screwed and I never play, so what did you expect? That's fine, but don't say you're going to win on Tuesday. He's not he- missing the cut. He is not going to miss the cut. This guy is automatic to make the cut. I think he'll break a record this year, like 24 straight years what or something like that. What do you mean like he's that. automatic to miss the cut? Like he's got different problems It's now. Augusta National, It's man. a side 500. Do you want Hills. side 500? Sure. Okay. On making the cut? Oh, yes. Whoa. Uh, abs- <laughs> uh, Strutty, witness, absolutely Whoa. I have him 100%. making the cut. 
I have him making the cut. I, this I, is I, what I see. Anybody I see else? J Mac, anybody else wants All right, it? We're Call taking me. it. Strutty, where are you at? Go ahead. Uh, yeah, no, I, this, this is what's going on. This, I, I think Tiger Woods has been one of the greatest athletes of all time, but his body is broken. And, and that, that you cannot compete at the highest level for four days straight walking that course. He's going to have a limp midday Friday. He, mm. He's going to have the limp and he's going to have a problem. And you just can't keep up that pace all the time. To win a championship, everything has to be perfect. You, you know, that, what's that show that I, I, I sometimes I was it making the cut or whatever it is? Mm-hmm. Like those guys, they are stressing out everything. If your body's not feeling good, it's hard to stress and have your body and try to play perfect. So, I mean, it'd be an amazing story, but I, I don't think he makes the cut either. Freddie, but what about it. this? And tell me if you think this is true. There's rumors out there that he's not engaging in sex. Do you believe that? <laughs> I, I think he can do whatever he wants. His body, like, I don't think it makes a difference. The body is broken. And, <laughs> and we've all seen enough players whose bodies break down. Eventually, you can't keep it. Like, it's a great story. And you'll probably have a decent day Thursday. But the body can't keep it up, guys. I, no. I just don't know how a body can keep up. So he can do whatever he wants at night, during the day, on his way to the, on the, way to the course. But yeah. the body isn't right. It's, okay. it's it, it, you can't play at that level, man. I, I hear what you're saying, and I, I understand that, and I'm not suggesting he's going to win. I'm saying I need 36 holes of him to make the cut. I think he could be straddling that line. I think it could get very dicey. I think him, him abstaining from sexual activity will push him over the line. Dude, personally. he likes it, though. You know he likes it. <laughs> exactly. I think he's very motivated. <laughs> I think he's not going through that without some sort of a payoff, and the payoff will be him playing on the weekend. That's what I'm banking on. But, yeah, Tiger, you know. I'll we'll, tell you we'll what, see. if he's missing late on Friday, you better run for your life if you're at any <laughs> tavern or something. <laughs> yeah, he, he'll be – the Tiger Mobile will be cruising around Augusta. Yes, you the big probably... giant tiger, plastic tiger like a parade. <laughs> it's like an ice cream <laughs> yeah. truck. He'll yeah. yeah. have a jingle, be driving around Augusta. Um, but, yeah, we got a lot to get into with Duffy. J.D. will join us in about 20 minutes. Um, Mark Shapiro in an hour. We're going to catch up with Mark in an hour as – We'll ask him, like, is he relieved now that the park is open? The Jays are playing. They got a win last night, packed house, 100% positive reviews, right? Everyone's got the, the same reviews in terms of what it's like in the house. Looks a little bit different, certainly on TV. The background behind the plate, which is the majority of your viewing experience. What did you think of that, different. the bricks or whatever? I, I found it odd a little bit. It's different. It's different. It's definitely different. I mean, for 35 years, it was the same background yeah. where you just knew it was fans. Mm-hmm. And even though they would cut off at some point, the screen would cut it off. You understood that it was a lower bowl. Um, now it's it's very exclusive. Like it, there's – how many seats are behind home plate? 30? 30? Yeah, it looks like it's very isolated. Obviously, it's very exclusive. Uh, I'm sure yeah. it's very expensive. Well, that shot we saw right there was – some of the brick was cut off, and I like that shot. I, For some reason, this is, like, really nitpicky. When it elevates and you see a bunch of bricks, I'm like, I don't like the bricks. Yeah. And I'm not some kind of mason guy that t- talks about jobs, but <laughs> I, I was like, I don't like the brick. I don't know. It's weird. It's different when people aren't in their seats. You know, that's – and that you can't control that. I'm sure when they built it, they're thinking, all right, all of these seats will be packed. Everyone will be on the edge of their seat. But you're right. As the game went on, people were walking around, and you could see behind it. And, yeah, the brick, I don't know if it's real brick or not. We can ask Mark. Yeah. But that's the kind of stuff they could change over time too, right? In a few years, if they don't like it or they want to paint it differently. Um, but the brick caught the caught the attention of a lot of people, right? Yeah. You've got the brick behind, behind home <laughs> okay. plate. Where are the people? Okay. You know, where, where, where's Getty Lee? Can we see him? I'm looking at, I'm looking at brick. You know what though? With so plate, many games in cool. big, in big league baseball, Hayes, that was, that was a big win for those guys. Huge win to start like that. Yeah. To start and to get people's attention and to have some positive vibes and a performance from Barrios. Like they, they needed that to kind of go according to script and it did. Yeah. All right, let's let's get you two or think you're there, Tim the Toolman Taylor here. You guys are worried about the brick. You're hung up on the brick. It's the experience when you're out there. I, I believe when you look back on the, the yeah, building but Strud, of, uh, we watch 162 on TV. I, I, I know, but it's experience about being in there. So that this is like I think that the, the that park. I think that uh, the park in Chicago what was it uh, after the Field, yeah. uh, No, the other one, the Comiskey. Oh, it used to be Comiskey, where the White Sox play. Yeah. yeah, I don't know what it's called. Those now. were like. 
I, as I remember, those are kind of the last one. They were just those huge spaces mm-hmm. with no feel. And then all of a sudden comes along uh, in Baltimore, Camden Yards, as I remember. That was the one that kind of came in, yes. and they, they kind of made it feel old school again. And I remember I went there, and it was beautiful. And now people are trying to recreate that. And you saw what they did in Chicago. They changed that look there with that, where the White Sox play. Now the Blue Jays are trying to make it more intimate. People want experience. They want to feel Because I was in uh, Toronto a couple of years ago when we went for the game, and it was huge. We were so far away from everything. And, and I want to feel more like I'm a part of it. I think that's mm-hmm. what makes those those buildings like Boston, obviously Chicago, some even Seattle. I think has done a nice job. I like that park there. It makes you feel like you're a part of it, rather than a mile away from home plate. You can barely see the ball, you know, whizzing past uh, Kirky. Yeah, that's exactly what they're trying to do. Like they've reduced the capacity by I think ten thousand seats. A lot, considering when it opened. Like when it opened, it was that was the whole number. Fifty-five Gs. Everyone every said game. fifty. Yeah. Always right. It was fifty thousand, fifty thousand, mm-hmm. and then they slowly started to shrink it over time. And they've taken a lot of seats out there now. The capacity is around forty grand, uh, which speaks to what what you're saying, Struddy. Like they want to make it more intimate. The fact that the right. all of the seats point towards home plate. That's obviously, if it's a ballpark, that's where you're centered, right? As opposed yeah. to it being this monstrosity in a stadium where you could be watching a football game or could be watching a concert or whatever. And all of those things have to be considered when you consider the Rogers Center is hosting massive concerts and massive events all the time. But if it's going to be a baseball park, it's got to feel like that. And I think that's obviously what they invested in. By all accounts, they feel this is as close to it as they could possibly get. And then, you you know, you top it all off. It was a celebration of that last night with a win. And you go back to the bump tonight, and uh, Mark will join us in about an hour. And so you got the Jays again. It's like deja vu. You got the Jays and the Leafs again tonight. And the Leafs get a win last night. And, you know, Matthew scores 65. So it's every night. His last three goals, he scored two. The one against Tampa and the one last night with the same goal. And that's when you kind of think that he's destined to get 70, when those, like, Fade away one timers from yeah. just inside the blue line or finding their way in the back of the net. You're like, this is like a 70 goal destiny mission where these are just going to go in. Right. Where like no one else, I, I, I can't tell you enough that no one else, that not Nadelkovic, that if that's Brody, if that's TJ Brody, he puts that in his glove and he shoves it in the corner. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so exactly. What, what what is like I, as a goal scorer, Doc? Like, what is Austin thinking there? Is he trying to put it there, or is he just trying to hit the net? Dude, when that you're was... that hot, strutty, you're like every time I can get it, and it's like we've broken it down so many times about how he goes top glove and how he goes yeah. five hole and how he goes here. When you have that ability, I, I, honestly, I just think, and I played on the president of the team's line, and his idea was get the puck on net as quick as possible. He mastered the quick release where it was like. <laughs> On yeah. the stick, you played with Shanny too, like on yeah, the I stick, did, yeah. off the lots stick. Lots of assists. And, and this guy, he's mastered it. He's like, <laughs> lots of assists. The, every time he shoots the puck, it's got a chance to go in the net. And now it's at a level where it's like those floating away one-timers from yeah. just inside the blue line, it just makes you think that he, he he's destined to get 70 goals. It feels that way because even the one off Savard on Saturday night, the same yeah. thing. And that was a smart play, a sneaky kind of wrap around, quickly get it on. It, it is. See what happens. But if that's but, Bobby McMahon, it probably goes in the corner somehow. Exactly. But, and he takes a penalty somehow. And it's like, how I, is this working? But, but everything's breaking goalie, his way right now. But I think Nadalkovic, honestly, guys, I think he's in his own head there. I think he's like – this. he knows where Austin Matthews. Goalies don't identify where the hot shooter is. And he's like, I got to get set. If Again, if that, you could mention any one of the other Leafs, he's probably more set and ready for that shot. Mm-hmm. But I think he's in his own head there. And he tries – I don't know if it's over-prepare or Ruddy, that whatever. goal cannot go in in that league. I don't care who uh, it is. That could be Mike think, Bossy or Ovechkin. But, the goalie can't let that fade away slapper. That, that that's not a goal in any league. No nope. way. No way. I've scored, listen, I've scored some like that in men's league, but I don't take that away from me. But when you look at that, honestly, I think the goalie again. If it's somebody else shooting that, no one's really. If that's the Bushkin, he's not worried about. It. But I mm-hmm. think he's. It's because it's the shooter. I I really do think that goalies overthink some shooters because they're not like this. Where's this guy going to put it? Rather than just doing their job and coming out and taking away that I shot. think you you might be on to something in terms of him realizing who it is and is this guy faking? Is he going to yeah. spin around and come in and rip one off the sidewall? Is he going shelf? Is he Because O's right. I think you're both right. That can't go in. That was a backbreaker for the Penguins. Oh, God. Um, but also yeah. it's Matthews and it, he did it to Vasilevsky last week. The, the same goal. That, like was he, a, that one on Vasilevsky was a knuckle puck though. It was on edge when he shot it and it 
dipped Still from and the dipped. same place. I mean, it was from outside off a draw, I believe, and in. Yeah. Anyway, he's up to 65. And uh, that was a one timer. There it is. But still, it was off a draw one timer. Boom! It's in the net, and he scored such a variety of goals that when you when you compile sixty five, you're gonna basically score every possible way. Yes. Um, and that's what he's done here. But you're right. The the fact that it the journey continues. Like now he's he needs five goals in his next five games. They're in Jersey tonight. He's had a good history there in terms of scoring goals. They got Jersey here on Thursday. Detroit here on Saturday. And then they roll through Florida and Tampa. And, you know, at a minimum, you would think they'll get through the weekend and he'll probably be at 66, 67. And, like, what he's done now is even those last two games in Tampa and Florida, even if he doesn't score between now and then, it's possible he could he could chase 70. Like, it's possible he could score two in a night, three in a night. It's unlikely against those two teams. Who knows where his head is going to be at. But it's interesting how this race is kind of hanging over because last night they win. He sets up – Matthew sets up McCabe. They win in overtime. It was crushing for Pittsburgh to lose out on that point. They're still in the race. I thought Pitt looked good. I thought Sid was fiery and great last night. And They looked it, real good, actually. Yeah, they're, they're like, a good they look team, like a team that was well. Yeah, they look like a team that's ready to kind of contend for playoff hockey, and they look like they're organized. So – I don't know what happened. The problem with them is they're running out of games, Hayes. That's like, it, exactly. They got yeah, four exactly. games. They needed that. And there was a situation in overtime where people were freaking out that Sidney Crosby, including myself, but I think he had a skate issue. I think he had a skate issue. He did, issue. Yeah. yeah. Sullivan said after the game the reason he didn't start or even get on was because of a skate issue, which is wild in 2024 wild that there's a skate issue now because of the way technology works where you can rip blades out and put a new one in 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 a second we saw that at the at the prospects game i i I have been out of the game obviously for so long i don't buy equipment i don't know anything (laughs) about equipment strati we go to the prospects game we're out there skating in you know in the morning noodles is holding on to the boards trying to get around the ice and there's kids literally in between drills going over to the trainer saying new blade uh, just pop this one off and put a new yeah. one on. It's a th- it's a twelve second transaction. It's a twelve second transaction. Yeah. I, I would guess it it probably gets abused. Like I'm sure players all, after shifts are like, screw it, throwing a new one. I think I lost an edge. Even though yeah. that was the explanation by Sullivan, I, I don't know how that's possible. Like how is it in the NHL possible? And I know they were on the fly. I don't believe they had a draw uh, in overtime. I think it was it was on the fly the whole time. But you got to get sit out. You got to leave Gino on the ice for the. I don't think Gino got on the ice in overtime. Dude, we, we've experienced this with the Maple Leafs. It's crazy, they had man. this little idea of David Camp, and I might it might have been Marner or someone else to start overtime. And I'm like, you have a lethal weapon on the bench, and you start him and you put him on after the second shift too. Mm-hmm. That's how you end this stuff. You don't have. To, these guys are just overthinking it. But that wasn't the situation last night because Sid couldn't go on. But where the hell was Gino Malkin? Right. Have him out and and Carlson out and basically double shift and keep them on the ice. Um, and there was a time when Keith would start camp and two defensemen in overtime, like it, that. I remember watching that and being like, "Is this guy serious? What is he doing?" Dude, you like, cannot sit down and study. Maybe you have some kind of explanation for that. Right. You can't give me anything where I would shake my head and say, "Oh, I thought about that wrong." You're totally right there. You put yeah. heat out and and follow it with heat until it's over. And that's the way it goes. There's yeah, no other yeah, way around it. I think what I what I think some of these times these coaches are thinking is that I want to win that opening draw. So oh. if it was if it was okay, me, the guy's put, six foot four. Austin Matthews is six foot four, two hundred and thirty yeah. pounds. Go out there and win a draw. <laughs> no, I get it, but I guess like for so if you don't have an Austin Matthews, you're you're another team. I'd put out this is what I would start. I'd probably start my two fastest forwards and my D and try to get that puck. And so you're at whoever it is, Matthews, Marner, and Riley. And I'll just kill 45 seconds. Then I put my heat out against the other teams, not, well, a little bit less heat. And then I got a chance. Because I've seen a lot of coaches do that, right? They're trying to win that draw, trying to kill it, uh, 45 seconds. And then you're going to, you're thinking you're scoring the second shift. And I, mm-hmm. I do get that, especially if you don't have the big guns that, you know, the Leafs or, you know, a lot of those teams. But Florida, Pittsburgh Tampa. does. Again, it was a skate issue. So, fine. Yeah. You take that for what it's worth. But even that, I mean, that may have cost them a, a point last night because Matthews, he got two shifts in before Sid got on the ice. Yeah. Like, Matthews started, and then they had a quick shift, and then he got back on the ice, and the rest is history. And the, J- the Leafs pick up two points last night, which, again, pushes Tampa further into the rear view um, and makes it more and more likely it will be Toronto versus Florida. 
And again, we know what Matthews is chasing, you know, 70 with five to go. And then McDavid is chasing 100 assists. He's a one off. You know, he can go out there with no skates on tonight or tomorrow night and probably hit 100 assists. But he didn't practice today. He's day to day. It's a lower body issue, is the information that I guess they're willing to hand out or Knobloch is willing to to um you know give out to the media and the fan base but i don't know strud what do you make of it like you got the you got the playoffs hanging over everything you got the playoffs starting in in less than two weeks nine to ten days away from that a hundred assists would be significant but do you see him playing again if he's 90 percent, 95 percent, or would you not put mcdavid back in unless he's 100 percent? Well, I think priority is his health. You want to make sure that he's as healthy as can be heading into game 83. So I, I think that if you're getting up to 90, 95%, I, I, you know, most guys, no one's really 100% during the course of the year. There's always something wrong, right? It's, it, there's always an issue. So, uh, you know, I think that today, you know, it's call it whatever maintenance day, then he got tomorrow and then see the game and see what happens and maybe he doesn't play, then you just kind of take it day by day. But, you know, obviously what he want, I'm sure he wants to get the 100 or the team wants him to get 100. But I just think that being healthy is so key, especially that guy. I mean, if you go through the lineup, I mean, you can't afford to lose him. You can't afford to lose Leon. And then who is, is it Ekholm the next guy? Probably, I'm overlooking yeah. Hyman, Skinner. who has 50 goals. Yeah. Skinner. Like, it, who are the three most important guys on any team? And you take one of them off. Uh, that changes everything, especially when it's Connor McDavid. So I think health for him is at the top or is the top of the list. Yeah. Ready, let me ask you this. I saw two gentlemen yesterday – Absolutely slap Canada across the face three times with a ranking. If you had a top 12, top Stanley Cup contender list, Stretty, where would the Oilers be? Like, just kind of ballpark it, eyeball it. Where would the Oilers be in a top 12 list as far as cup contenders for you? Well, I, for me, I got, well, I, I guess. No, I, I don't want to go through. I don't want to hear what. I know. I, well, where try- would the Oilers be? I think they're the, the, the second tier of, of teams. And I'd have Dallas in that top tier, Florida in that top tier. And I'd kind of have them after that, right? Then I'd, yeah, so I'd say that second grouping, which is, what is that? I, I, from three through f- seven? Yeah, three, three to six, three, seven, somewhere in there. Okay. Somewhere in there, I think, is That's fair. That's reasonable, I think. That's precisely where I had them, Struddy, and it was deemed disrespectful <laughs> yesterday. I think it was professional. And I think well, who's it was your top two? Like, who, who would you guys be top two? I had guys? Rangers in Carolina. Like I, and a lot of Over that is Dallas. Be, yeah, well, a lot of that again is because of who they're going to. Dallas might get Vegas now. Like Vegas yeah. lost last night. If it okay. started tonight, they'd get Vegas. Okay. So, do I think Dallas would win that? I, I think they would, but I can't guarantee that. If Vegas is healthy and rocking and playing, yeah. and Aiden Hill returns and Stone returns, I'm not sure that's a door I want to knock on. If I'm Dallas, and I, I like Dallas a lot. Like I like all these teams. We expressed that many times yesterday, and we will multiple okay. times between now and the start of the playoffs. I just think. The Rangers are going to get Pittsburgh in the first round, Detroit in the first round. Carolina's going to get the Islanders yeah. in the first round. I just think the easiest st- point. the easiest matchups in the first round are going to be the winner of the Metro and the second place in the Metro, and that's the Rangers in Carolina. And it doesn't mean that once they face each other or they face the Bruins or Florida or Tampa or Toronto or whatever, it's a lock that they get through. I just think the more and more you can look at a team and say, I think they'll get deeper or a better chance they get deeper, yeah. then that's why the odds will skew their way. I just think the Edmonton Oilers, with those two guys and what their mission statement was this year, if that Stuart Skinner can stop some pucks and not get pulled seven times in the playoffs, I got him in my top three to do damage. I've got Who's them in ones? my top three to do damage. With who? Come again? Who else who do you have three? if you have a top three? I don't need you? to get into the specifics of what else <laughs> okay. is going to be well, lying around just, it. I just I think the Oilers. Exactly. And there's, no, you don't have to. There's a lot of factor study because you, like, Hayes <laughs> liked to fa- Hayes, he wanted to factor in the path and different yeah, things. I just want to simplify it. If the Edmonton Oilers can get Stuart Skinner to stop pucks and those guys heat up and Evander Kane can stop arguing with people on the bench and he can be a big-time player and a big-time factor – they're going to be real dangerous. So, so what's hard about this question? Who are the other two teams you have in there? Like I gave you my, I showed you mine. Show me yours. Yeah, there you go, Strud. Who do you have? Who? Just give us a couple teams you're I, looking at. I've got a lot of respect for the Dallas Stars and what they could possibly do. If right. Ottinger goes Ottinger from a couple years ago, yeah. and those young studs can can up the ante come playoff time, 
they could do serious damage. I'm not as bullish on the New York Rangers as you guys. I know they're well coached. They've got a lot of star players. But what has Zabinijad like? What has he done in the playoffs? Like, what what has he done to make you guys think that he's going to be a rock star come playoff time? Yeah, listen, that's a legitimate question. I, I think you look up up the middle of the ice in New York compared to other teams. There, it's kind of like Boston. It's got, they, their strength is on the wing. I think their strength is on defense, and their strength is in net. That's the Rangers. That's the Bruins. Um, that yeah. you might argue Dallas. I mean, hints they yeah. they have guys up the middle of the ice down there that are pretty good. But D. yeah, but their defense are oh. big. They're good. They're strong. They've got a really good goalie. Like that kind of is where we're we're going here. With if if you like the Oilers or you like the Leafs, you know, to use those two as an example in this country, it's probably because you like the middle of the ice or you like their star players and you think they're just going to be so driven that they're yeah. going to take over a game, take over a series. And beyond that, it's generally you know depth, size, defense, goaltending. You know, there's there's such a variety of teams. I think that's why it sets up to be uh, truly a, a, a could be a shocking playoff. Like it really could be any variety of uh, combinations here in terms of who gets to a final four, who gets yeah. to the cup final, and who ends up winning. Um, that's healthy. That's, that's a great. Good thing. Exactly. It's a great thing. But you know, being a hundred percent certain of anything, I, I think, is silly right now and is basically an impossibility. Uh, considering the way the season's played out. All right, Mark Shapiro will join us just after 5 o'clock. Strud or dud coming up in about an hour, right? Previously known as, confirm or deny, it's going to be strud or dud today. The muffin, man. I, I don't know if I can do that, though. I don't oh, think I can muffin. play that. I don't think the muffin man can be played. Although JP has full autonomy over that, so if he wants to play it, he'll play it. Um, and Duffy's coming up. J.D. from Augusta, his take on what he's seen out of Tiger, heard from Tiger, seen and heard from John Romp today. Also get into his take on the Canadian hockey scene as we move closer to the Stanley Cup playoffs. James Duffy is coming up. Jason Strudwick with us with the O-Dog Jeff O'Neill. I'm Brian Hayes. Overdrive continues, TSN 1050 and on TSN 4. Overdrive continues, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line to the final score. We'll get to our best bets later this afternoon. Strud or Dud coming up in about an hour. Mark Shapiro in about a half an hour. But uh, Augusta National Ooh. is alive and well, man. It looks good looks every year. Good. Did you every see year. our guy holding the mic yesterday? Man, oh, man. <laughs> yeah, Duthie <laughs> is absolutely in his element down there. Uh, Graham Dillette looks great. You know, Weeks, he looks great. Duffy has some competition though. Scully's down there, and Scully is Man like rocket. six foot four. Man rocket. His his <laughs> arms were out, and I am curious if Duffy needs to send a cease and desist, and basically tell him you got to wear a quarter zip now if you're going to be yeah. on my desk. Got to be a quarter yeah. zip. Go borrow some of Paul McGinley's clothes to start making me look good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's head down to Augusta. Here's James Duffy. How did you respond to Scully with the pipes out this morning? He won't be coming back. <laughs> He's intimidating, huh, Jimmy? I didn't know he was going to be down here. I was not pleased. <laughs> and you're right. I think some sort of oversized windbreaker mm -hmm. or something is mandatory, something that makes him look more pudgy because he is uh, like a, he's a beast. And if you ever played golf with him, like I always say, always the best golfer at TSN, but Scully is hits a, a freaking mile yeah yeah he's something else so yeah I, look i've always said uh and you guys know this the only reason um i ever look like i have any physical stature is because i i wear the youth mediums and because weeks he is kind enough to be a, a long distance runner so he makes himself very skinny and so i look large in comparison mm -hmm. so the keys the only keys really are small shirts and uh, skinny analysts well, it's working for you. That's why I was losing weight, right? Oh, on the panel, you're making JD yeah. look good every single night. I'll That's tell you what, I might have consider. to call Bobby Weeks to get some running tips about how to get better running. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, Jimmy, Tiger again today. He starts off on a Tuesday by saying, it's about a win. I think if I, it all comes together, I can win. And it's like, it's the same routine. And obviously everyone knows what, what it felt like, what it looked like in 19 when he pulled the trigger on it. But... Mm -hmm. It's just Tuesday, the way I describe it always, Tuesday I can win, and then Friday he tells Todd Lewis walking off the course, well, I never play and my back's killing me, so what would you expect? 
It's like they can't be both. Well, I, I think in, in his mind they can because it's just the way he's programmed. And I think, oh, if he's hitting the ceremonial tee shots in 20 years, he'll still come out and say he could win mm-hmm. because that's just that's just the way he is. And I, I know that drives you nuts. It drives me a little bit nuts too. Um, but I think he has to convince himself of that. And, and that's what – I mean, if you listen to all – most of them are like that. No one's going into that press conference and saying, you know, honestly, I'm just hitting it everywhere. And if I'm, if I'm top 30, it's, it's a win this week. They, they all, they all, I think they all have the psychology coaches and, and such. And so Tiger's just on a different level. By the way, on that note, uh, we had Nick Taylor uh, drop by our set yesterday. And this was one, I'll get the clip and like tweet it out at some point, or we'll play it during the broadcast. But you know, I was asking him, Oh, and I always have these conversations when, you know, the, the Canadians are in the hunt on the weekends and quite often things don't go well. Oh, and I usually try to guess their scores and, and you didn't, Taylor's you didn't one. reveal any of the things. That no, I did not. Okay. I did not. But what I asked him legitimately was there's so many guys that, you know, if you take away like the top 10 or 15 players in the world that are used to it. So the guys, the second tier guys that are, let's say they're they're they get in the hunt once every four or five tournaments or maybe once every 10 or whatever. And so many of them don't do well because they're not used to being in that position. And Nick Taylor seems to be the opposite that he seems to thrive when he's in, when he's in the hunt. And I asked him about that and he started talking about like his psychology training. And he said that recently he was working with a coach and they put him in this like electronic headgear and he goes out on the course and there's a drone. And when, when he's in the zone, which he calls something else, the flow state, he calls it flow state. What? The, the drone takes off and starts flying around. <laughs> I, was, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> and so he's like, yeah, that's what, that's what we do. So he has a head. You imagine you're, <laughs> and you know, oh, that I like to buy all the devices. If you so get the flow I state head drone, head drone, I think that thing would just crash. Thing. It would crash right in the range and just oh, say, this guy's done. done. <laughs> the first, as soon as I blade a chip over the green, the drone's dead in the pond. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. Oh, I love it. James, you know, the last couple of years, there's been a lot of talk, the live versus the PGA guys, and now we've got uh, John Romp uh, in the house. Is that conversation still up uh, and, and still a factor, as you've seen in the past seasons at the Masters? I don't think so. Last year, you know, it was sort of the first time, and, and that was the big storyline here. And, and I, I still think it is one. I don't think it is so much with the players. I mean, there, there's still some, I guess, bitterness individuals. Some don't care. I think some of the guys uh, are, you know, less respected than some of the other guys. I don't get the feeling like, you know, some of the guys like Kepka and DJ that just sort of went over there. I don't think they were ever really disliked. I mean, there's some lingering bitterness with Phil and some of the others, but I, I think the story's more just about the mystery of the live players because you don't know what to expect, right? You can, I, I mean, the shot data analysis and all that with that tour now, but, you know, like Kepka's playing garbage on the live tour right now, but does that mean anything at all? Because does he care whatsoever? I don't think so. I think all he cares about is is these majors, and he's basically stated that. So unlike the PGA Tour players where we can sit and go, okay, this guy's got three top tens in the last four or whatever it is, with the live guys, I just don't know how much those tournaments matter. So I think it makes it intriguing for the week that you just don't know what you're going to get from from Cam Smith or from Patrick Reed or DJ or, or Rahm. Or anything. I mean, I think you're going to get a good tournament from Rahm and probably from Kepka, but... I'm, it makes it compelling, but I, I don't know that the rivalry between the two tours ends up being much of an issue anymore here this week. Can you explain the Augusta National-Rory relationship? Because if you look at Rory's physical talents, you would think that he would have three to four green jackets right now. I mean, mm-hmm. he can blister a 345-yard draw around all those par fives and have mm-hmm. six irons in his hands – and I know he had the one year where he had the big lead on 10, and he absolutely just threw up all over himself. Like, is that scar tissue? Why hasn't this guy got it done there? I think it has a lot to do with that. I mean, you can equate it, you know, the year, the year Spieth, Spieth wins, and then he comes back the next year, and he has, what, a 
five stroke lead at some point on after seven and hits two in the water and and he hasn't so I don't know if he's been the same guy since even though he's won since and Rory Rory had this thing that you know every time I'm here he comes back and he seems to have a different like mental plan some years he's like well I'm yeah. just gonna try and treat it like any other tournament just like the John Deere and then some years he's like no, I'm going to really focus in. And this year it's more like, I don't know, enjoying golf and enjoying that you're at the masters. But he, I think that all of those things say that it's deep in his head. And as the years go by, I mean, some of it's just, you know, luck, right? Oh, where you just, you know, you're not on one week or somebody mm-hmm. plays better. He had that second a couple of years ago. He's had some really good tournaments here, but I think eventually when you're asked about it all the time and it's the number one storyline coming into the Masters every single year, whether Rory completes the career Grand Slam, that it does get in your head. And he starts to count the number of years he has left in his prime to do it. And it's really, it's reflected most in his first rounds. So I think the closest he's been to the lead in the last, I think, five, six years after the first round has been six strokes. He's been six back. He's been seven back. He's been eight back. He's been 11 back. And that's essentially the tournament for him. Because I think if you look at Masters numbers, uh, something like, I think the last, I don't know, 11 winners or something like that have been in the top 10 after round one. Something like 35 of 37 have been within two shots of the lead or three shots of the lead after 36 holes. So he has this bad opening round. And ends up, you know, backdooring for a second or a top five, but he's never really in it. So I, I, the simple thing with Rory, I think, is he's got to he's got to be out and shoot, you know, shoot a 69 or a 70 or something decent on Thursday uh, that he can follow up with. And I think if he can, you know, get to the weekend legitimately in the hunt, you know, in the top five, in the top seven, that um, I think he might see something. With James Duthie down at Augusta, live coverage of the Masters all week on TSN. Um, I'm sure you run into a lot of Canadians down there that ask you about the Canadians in the field, but probably also ask you about hockey. And, you know, we we were discussing it like we've been doing for weeks, if not months, and we'll certainly do for the next two weeks leading up to the Stanley Cup playoffs. You know, where are these four Canadian teams rank among these other you know, studs in the NHL. There's a lot of parody right now, but we know Edmonton, Vancouver, Winnipeg, and Toronto are going. They're all clicking. Vancouver beat Vegas last night. Edmonton's rocking. The Leafs are rocking. Winnipeg feels good. Um, yet, it feels like they get kind of pushed aside a little bit, and maybe this is a Canadian thing, because of the Canadian drought. So, in other words, a 30-year drought means the team playing in 23-24 um, they get labeled with that, right? And they, they maybe don't get the necessary respect or love. Do you see it that way? Where, where does the drought come into play in terms of the way you view the Canadian teams and the likelihood that one of them can win a cup this year? I don't think it matters to them because it's like anything else. I mean, they weren't a part of – most of these are, you know, they're average 25 years old, so they weren't part of the drought. And I mean, they hear about it from us, but – I don't really think it's relevant. I mean, I mean, I think sort of individual team droughts they hear about more, maybe the Leafs hear more about the 50 years or whatever. <laughs> you talk about it down here, and you're right. Like every, there's so many Canadians that come to Augusta. And uh, I was chatting with, we were following the Canadian group today. They all played together, Nick Taylor's dad. <laughs> Nick Taylor's dad's a massive Leafs fan. And I was walking with him, and he says... Uh, just what are your? Just wanted your take on on the Leafs for the playoffs. I said, oh, I, 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 said I said I I actually like you know I think they look kind of more like a playoff team this year and I just I always had this philosophy that you know mathematically somewhere along the way there that something's going to go right you know a goalie's going to get hot or and they'll they'll make a run and I thought I was I was trying to boost his spirits a little bit by saying that and he pauses and he goes they're inherently flawed. <laughs> and then he gave me a long speech about how they're never going to win. Oh, and I was no. like, oh, that's more than I was expecting. Um, but I don't know. To answer your question, I, I, I think the drought, I guess, I don't think it, it hangs around these guys. Necks. I think it's just a thing. And I definitely don't think that if the Leafs or the Oilers or the Canucks or the Jets make it to the Stanley Cup final, that, you know, before game 
six, Connor McDavid's going to stand up in the room and say, or Austin Matthews and say, let's do it for Canada. Let's end the, end the drought. I honestly, I don't think they care. No, they just, they just want to win the Stanley cup. By the way, the other conversation I had about hockey today was with uh, your big fan of the show, Steve Sands, who I guess is coming on, isn't he? Tomorrow yes, he's Sands, he's been locked in for months. Yeah, it's he's an annual such event. a massive hockey fan. <laughs> uh, he was just whining, whining about his team today, and uh, uh, he loves your show. So uh, Sandy did not want to talk golf at all. He just wanted to talk about hockey. So yeah, you're right, a it's, a, it's a big topic down here. As it should be. Yeah, Sansi coming on tomorrow. It'll be great. Yeah, he's a big Caps fan, big Commanders fan. He, I think. Just, he just went on a seven-minute rant about the Caps. It was amazing. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> In between live at the Masters, Sansi yeah. yelling about Ovechkin. And, <laughs> it's, it's great. Yeah, that's outstanding. All right, buddy. Well, enjoy it down there. Um, we'll do it again, if not later in the week, early next week. And we appreciate you doing this as always. Yeah, no problem. Man. Good luck with the belt tonight, uh, there. Okay, I'm cheering for you. Slam dunk. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Bye, bye, James Duffy. Yes, Lindsay Hamilton, I believe, hosting tonight. So the belt oh. continues even without JD. It doesn't matter if Duffy's there. The belt and the quiz continue on the panel. Uh, Leafs Devils tonight on TSN Radio and on TSN Four. So it's a big one tonight. We'll continue to tee that up. Look back on the win last night. The Jays with a win last night. They're back in action tonight. Mark Shapiro will join us in about. 20 minutes. Mike Johnson, he'll join us a little bit later this afternoon as well. Overdrive continues, TSN 1050 and on the TSN app. All right, Mark Shapiro coming up in about 15 minutes. Strud or dud in about 40. And we got a Leaf game tonight. We got a Blue Jay game tonight. We got a Raptors game. The Raptors' final home game tonight at home against the Pacers. Only a 12 and a half point dog on FanDuel. So who knows? They've won two in a row, right? You get a third tonight. Maybe you, maybe you beat Siakam. Feels like they play Pascal every week and a half. Ever since he's been <laughs> traded, I think this is the third time they're going to play him. But last they, home game, how many total? They got four left, I believe. Get that. Yeah, over they're ready to with. go. They're 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 finished. The U hauls are packed. Like the, I don't know if there's. I guess they're coming home probably for a locker clean out. But there could be some guys who just say, Expedia. "I'm out of here." Yeah, exactly. See you later. We can Zoom call if we have to, but <laughs> I'm just not doing this. It's I'm a not grind. coming back. Such it's a, a grind. grind. Such, Such a grind. And it's it's like I get it. It's it's great to play in a major league sports, and I, I it's so lucky. You're, we're all so fortunate to be able to have done that. But at the end of the day, you're still human, and losing is really hard to deal with. It's yeah. hard, and there's there doesn't seem to be a lot of like nothing's going to change in the next four games. They could win one, but it's still that you're you're not the team you want to be. And it just, no. it's really, really bad. The, the money can't make, it's just like the saying, money can't make you happy, Strud, because I don't know how many bad teams you played on, but the misery of going to the rink every day. Oh, it's hard. It's just, it, you, you could have all the money in the world. It's the most miserable experience. Like, I can remember the anxiety of just thinking how mad the coach was <laughs> or did he want to go over video of my garbage and then just like, just the misery of dealing with everyone during that time. It's awful, man. It's not fun at all. And 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 you're right. There, there, you do get paid to play the game, which is fantastic. But you still are competitive. You want to win. You want to win the games. And you're trying your best. And then it feels like at times when you're trying your best, it just goes worse. Yeah. And now it goes sideways. Now it's and everybody worse gets a before. hate on for each other because yeah. it's like oh, – we're losing, movement. and you just yeah. start watching guys, and you're like, there's a reason we lose, because that guy doesn't back check, and that guy doesn't right. finish his hits, and that goalie yeah. sucks, and this is why we all lose. That's why yeah. we're losers. It's Then the coach is just losing it. Absolutely losing it. And Oof. I get it, because they're, they're under pressure to win, too. Mm -hmm. Like, it's just – so I, I tell you, the, when you're on a, a, a non-playoff team, you want to get out of the season as quickly as possible – and healthy. I always felt sick for the guys that got hurt like four games left. You're like, ooh, oh, that's a tough terrible. one. Terrible. You got to rehab all summer. Oh. You're supposed to go to Europe Brutal. for a month. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's that, that's triggering, right? That that would sting. Um, but yeah, that, like that's why you know the competitive nature of athletes. That's we talk about Tiger, but Tiger he fights to get out there. He he could he could never play again, and it wouldn't matter. I mean, the guy's already established himself as if not the greatest player of all time, certainly a Mount Rushmore player. And yet he's going out there because he wants to play. He wants to compete. And, you know, we mentioned that his back was spasming at Riviera, you know, a month and a half ago. It kind of reminded us of Mike Tyson after that fight he lost, where Mike had made a lot of money, 
but he's still got in the ring. He's still going to get in the ring. He's going to fight one of the Paul brothers coming up. You want to hear that Mike Tyson clip, him and Jim Gray, that we referenced yesterday? Let's hear it. It's a classic. Life. Mike, were you really sick this week? What was the problem? I broke my back. What do you mean by that? You broke my back, back is broken. What a, a vertebrae or, or well, what portion? Spinal. You did that in sparring? No, I did it um, by a motorcycle accident. The doctor discovered I was doing my sit-ups 2,500 a day with my 20-pound weight, and one day I couldn't move anymore. And I asked the doctor, "What's wrong?" And he said, um, "Believe it or not, it's wearing your back is broken slightly." So, are you in pain right now? All right. So, anyway, it broke his back, spinal. Yeah, what? it's that was. A, I don't know why we referenced that yesterday. I think it was coming off Tiger, and it's just a wild explanation after a fight where he lost. I don't think clearly. Jimmy Gray was confused back in his heyday because that was Jimmy in his prime, but he was yeah. like. Final. Vertebrae? What are you t- in a motorcycle accident? What are you talking about? Uh, imagine doing twenty five hundred sit ups a day with a twenty five pound weight. That's I don't know wild. if there's been like the the Chicago Bulls last dance type of doc on Tyson, but yeah. I, I would watch that because oh. that guy, dude, I think he's burned through three hundred and forty million dollars. Oh, it's crazy the amount of money he's lost. Yeah, he's three hundred and forty million. <laughs> yep. Yeah, he's gone through it all. Busy. He's gone through it all. He's he's on record saying that. Uh, all right, Mark Shapiro coming up into the next hour. Strutter Dud at five twenty-five. Leafs in action. Jays in action. Raptors in action. The Masters is here. It's a great week. Overdrive continues. TSN ten fifty and on TSN four.